Okay, so let me begin. Um, the topic, as uh, Professor Ayako introduced, this is about the responsiveness of low and middle income country health systems. And what I'm going to do today is to talk about the challenges, talk about the uh, opportunities that as focus on responsiveness of health systems uh, allows us to, uh, to, to engage with and to, to respond to. So before we, before we start, uh, I would like to reiterate what uh, uh, Professor Ayako said. At, at different points in the presentation, different points in the lecture, if any of you has got any questions, any of you would like to uh, raise and share a thought, I suggest feel free to interrupt me. Uh, if I'm in the middle of speaking and I'm in the middle of uh, making a point, I will, I will finish it and then I'll give the floor to you so that we can have a dialogue as required and you don't have to collect all your questions. Um, you don't have to collect all your thoughts till the very end. Uh, another possibility would be to raise your hand and uh, Professor Ayoko could um, interrupt me and say, hey, Sumit, there is somebody who would like to ask a question at this point of time. So that's one. The other bit is that I will also pause uh, at different points of time, at least two or three times, I would say, to solicit your thoughts and questions so that if anybody has collected uh, some thoughts and questions, that would be a moment to say, okay, you said this, can we hear a bit more about it? Um, so this is how I foresee the, the lecture, the session proceeding. Of course, there is earmark time at the very end to, to systematically ask questions that you may have collected and haven't asked them in the middle of the lecture. So let's, let's begin. Um, let me begin by talking about something that all of you, um, many of you who work in the field of public health, in the field of health systems are aware of. We know that the World Health Organization around the year 2000 introduced this idea of health systems as consisting of a bunch of building blocks. And it talked about the overall goals of a health system. Uh, the overall goals being improved health uh, in terms of level and equity, improved efficiency and performance of health systems, social and financial risk protection, and responsiveness. So those of you who have been wondering, hey, what is Sumit going to talk about? I'm going to talk about one of the goals of a health system. No matter where in the world we might be, we are all working towards this particular goal. Now, the thing is, even if this has been an appreciated, a recognized, widely accepted goal of the health system all over the world, of all the goals, the four goals, this particular goal tends to be the most under-researched. This particular goal tends to be the least explicitly um, tackled in public health policy and practice. And, and this is what uh, Professor Ayako said, actually, when she was introducing me. This is what I'm interested in. The argument here is that we we are reaching a stage in many low and middle income country health systems where we need to start focusing also on the responsiveness uh, of the health system. So the argument I make in this presentation and the argument on the basis of which I have, and I'm working towards developing this program of work and research is that low and middle income country economies and health systems are evolving. Uh, the argument is that over the last few decades, we have worked hard and in most parts, particularly the low middle to middle income country health systems, availability of services is no longer an issue. Uh, accessibility of services is also no longer an issue. In some cases, geographical access might be an issue, but by and large, availability and accessibility related concerns as being slowly resolved. And citizens' expectations from their health system uh, are also changing and evolving. People are expecting more. People want services to be good. People want services to meet their expectations. 
And we will come back to this idea of expectations at multiple times uh, in this lecture uh, as, I, as I develop these ideas further. These transitions, the, the economic transitions, the epidemiological transitions, the transitions within health systems in terms of uh, availability improving, in terms of accessibility improving, requires a change in the way low and middle income country health systems operate. It also requires a change in the way we as health policy and systems researchers working in global health uh, approach our inquiries. I argue uh, throughout this presentation that these changes, these transitions present some really unique challenges and opportunities for researchers. They of course present a whole lot of challenges for policymakers and practitioners which many of you graduates of your master's programs will uh, go on to become. And, and this is what we are interested in, in tackling in this session. Uh, the, the objectives of the lecture, the objectives of this session are to understand and unpack the concept of a responsive health system. Some of it you will realize as I speak and as I go through this is fairly intuitive, but we will still go through it systematically. We will also discuss some adjacent concepts, concepts which are uh, very close to the idea of a responsive health system. Once we've done that, we will discuss some challenges and opportunities around operationalizing, translating the idea of a responsive health system into policy and practice, and in researching health systems responsiveness. The the challenges around researching are not limited to researching this subject, this concept within low and middle income country health systems. This applies to um, all contexts, I would say. The challenges and opportunities around operationalizing in policy and practice, however, because my expertise in, is in low and middle income country health systems, uh, I think I can only speak to it from that particular uh, starting point or vantage point, if you we will also briefly reflect upon some dilemmas entailed in comparing and researching uh, the responsiveness across and between different uh, health systems. Let's, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, uh, I share with you here, and I would like you to spend a, a, a some minutes, maybe some seconds to read this carefully. This is how the World Health Organization has defined responsiveness. Uh, the, the One of the four goals of the health system, they talk of responsiveness as the outcome that can be achieved when institutions and institutional relationships are designed in such a way that they are cognizant of and respond appropriately to the universally legitimate expectations of individuals. Now, this is a handful, this is a mouthful, and in this session, we will unpack this definition. We will unpack these ideas, the ideas that are introduced in this definition. Uh, we will return to this definition and different aspects of it in detail uh, throughout this session. Let's begin, uh, however, with some adjacent concepts first. Let's talk about the kinds of words that are commonly used, that commonly come up in discussions when we are talking about responsiveness. Uh, and, and two concepts particularly stand out. That is uh, quality of care and patient satisfaction. Quality of care can cover a wide spectrum of things. And while we cannot possibly cover this topic as a part of this session, some points are really worth highlighting. Uh, we can distinguish between structural quality, which refers to things like dimensions like continuity of care, uh, costs of care, accommodation, uh, the physical accommodation, accessibility of services. We can also talk of process quality, which involves the dimensions of things like uh, courtesy, uh, politeness, sharing of information, uh, autonomy to patients and decision making. It also or can also relate to the competence of providers, both 
technical competence and also the 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 social competence cultural competence as is sometimes being called uh we can also talk about within quality of care service quality uh, people like kanagi and berik referred to a set of issues including communication sign posting information provision and the interaction of staff with patients while referring to uh, what they call service quality as part of your studies in public health and more generally in health services you might have heard the name of don abidian and don abidian talked about 30 years ago 40 years ago actually 1980 uh, he considered interpersonal aspects of quality of care and amenities of care alongside the technical aspects of quality of care to be the important components of uh, quality within healthcare settings he talked about the interpersonal quality being defined as the quality of interaction between patients and providers uh, or the friendliness the attentiveness of healthcare providers uh, and and the literature suggests that the aspects of personal interactions in the quality of care literature uh, are quite close to or uh, quite overlapping with the ideas of respect and dignity that we will see uh, uh, are talked about in the concept of responsiveness so g- this is a sort of s- broad snapshot and there are books written about it about the idea of quality of care but particularly the interpersonal aspects of quality of care are uh, quite adjacent to the idea of responsiveness as I'll, uh, i'll i'll come back to later similarly the idea of uh, patient satisfaction uh, has many overlaps with the notion of the concept of responsiveness uh, patient satisfaction represents a complex set of things Uh, and it's a mix of perceived needs that people have perceived expectations and expectations that people have and also the kinds of experiences people have it's a very personal thing uh, i am satisfied you are satisfied i might be satisfied you might not be satisfied with the same service the same interaction uh, this lecture perhaps uh, or the lectures before this uh, the whole seminar series or the whole lecture series you know it, it's a very personal thing uh and and these two patient satisfaction and responsiveness are quite close to each other and and if you look at the definition of responsiveness and we are returning to the definition of responsiveness uh certain things stand out responsiveness is and we can compare this constantly by distinguishing between responsiveness and patient satisfaction uh responsive is different from patient satisfaction and quality of care um uh, and, and along three broad lines uh. in terms of its scope patient satisfaction focuses on the clinical interaction in specific healthcare settings whereas responsiveness evaluates the system as a whole yeah in terms of range patient satisfaction generally covers both medical and non medical aspects whereas responsiveness focuses only on the non health enhancing aspects of the health system now if you if you look at the definition you will notice these things responsiveness is about institutions and institutional relationships it's about the design and functioning of institutions and institutional relationships uh, it is about health systems being able to be cognizant of and being able to uh, respond appropriately to the universally legitimate expectations of individuals it is about the non medical aspects of care experience and the care encounter so so the so the rationale is also different somehow patient satisfaction uh, represents a complex mix of perceived needs individually determined all of them individually determined and the expectations which are also individually determined and experiences of care which are also about what individuals experience whereas if you look at responsiveness as is laid out here it is about uh legitimate expectations yeah so while this satisfaction tends to look at the system from the provider's perspective in the case of responsiveness the emphasis is on the needs of the user of the system not the individual 
but the user at large. And responsiveness, unlike satisfaction, uh, involves an evaluation of the health system against agreed norms. Huh? This is what we mean by uh, universally legitimate or accepted expectations. So it involves an evaluation of the health system by individuals and people in society, of course, against agreed norms and standards. Responsiveness moves towards getting individuals to rate their health system against some kind of objectively set standards uh, rather than evaluate their personal satisfaction. This distinction is important, yeah? And, and this, this separation between these two uh, or three concepts, quality of care, satisfaction, individual satisfaction with care, uh, and responsiveness uh, is important to get. There are a lot of overlaps, uh, but, but there are some key features of responsiveness that really stand out. And I'll highlight two. Responsiveness is about institutions and institutional relationships. It is about the design and functioning of institutions and institutional relationships. It relates to people's experiences of interacting with their health system, be it with individuals, that is specific service providers, uh, be it specific processes, example, uh, um, reception, uh, payment of service charges, uh, diagnostic services, or organizational and institutional arrangements like uh, services around grievance redress, uh, uh, complaining, uh, giving feedback to the organization. And of course, also to the physical environment, uh, whether there are facilities appropriate, there's water, there are toilets, and so on and so forth. So this particular institutional relationship locates people's experience at the heart of what entails a, a responsive health system. So I know I've said quite a bit uh, from what I've discussed so far. I'm, I hope you would recognize that people's interactions with the health system uh, and, and are a bit different from their interactions with an individual provider sitting inside a clinic in the middle of a care encounter and so on and so forth. But you would also start recognizing, I hope, that people, how people experience this interaction with the health system uh, is also shaped by their individual expectations. Whether even if we don't want them to, it, it somehow relates to that. And it is also shaped by their relationships and their background uh, as an individual, as a family, with, with, and, 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 and all of this shapes their expectations. So the notion that becomes key here in understanding the idea of responsiveness is the idea about expectations. At the very basic level, expectations are individuals' predictions of what is likely to happen uh, in a particular interaction. I give you the example of coming into this lecture. Many of you perhaps had a clear expectation of, okay, what is Sumit going to talk about? Uh, some of you had no clear idea. Some of you went and read about this topic and said, okay, now that I know and I've seen what Professor Ayako has shared, this is what I expect. So an ex expectation is a reference point against which people benchmark the performance of individual interactants. In the case of health services, individual providers, particularly uh, services and the system at large. And, and organizational scientists, and I refer to the work of Oliver and Weiner here, they have differentiated between what they call active and passive expectations. They talk about active expectations being those which are at a high level of consciousness, a higher level of consciousness, and are therefore uh, instrumental or key in the decision to use a particular service. Yeah. So I expect to walk into an iPhone store and get the latest iPhone. 
I expect to go into my GP's office or GP's clinic, and I expect to see a friendly, all-knowing, uh, you know, a nice doctor with whom I interact, who knows what I need, and so on and so forth. These are active expectations, which are, you know, which are at a higher level of consciousness. They are up there, and we know what to expect. In contrast, Oliver and Weiner talk about passive expectations. Yeah, these are only generally true assumptions, and are not processed unless and until they are disconfirmed. What does this mean? Within the health system context, people may not take notice of, or they may be indifferent to. Uh, that is, uh, they may not feel satisfied or not satisfied with the health system until a particular interaction involves some form of confirmation of their active expectation. Example, acceptability of services or a violation of their passive expectations. To give an example again, I walk into my GP's office, my GP's clinic, my general practitioner's, my doctor's clinic, knowing fully well that there will be nobody else there. Only he and I would be interacting. But then suddenly I see a bunch of students sitting there. My expectations of privacy are suddenly disconfirmed. Only then do my passive expectations kick in. I say, okay, I expected this. This is not happening. So that's the distinction one needs to make. And that also applies to how people perceive their experience of the health system. And that shapes people's understanding of the responsiveness of the health system. Uh, and we will, we will come back to this in a little more detail later in the presentation. Uh, and, and while I'm giving you the example uh, of a clinical encounter, what I'm talking about constantly is the non-clinical aspects of care. Huh? Whether my doctor takes good care of me, is he polite to me, is he kind to me, does he keep my privacy, and so on and so forth. We are going to come back to this in a little more detail, but I've introduced to you some adjacent concepts, uh, quality of care, patient satisfaction, which are quite closely related to the notion of uh, responsiveness. And I have also introduced to you an important core feature which underpins the idea of responsiveness. Huh? We, we've to, I've introduced to you the con concept of expectations, and I'm going to come back to it in a little more detail later. With, with, having, with having done this, let me then dive into uh, the WHO's definition and its elaboration in the form of a framework. I would like to pause here briefly and to see and ask if anybody would like to raise a question, would like to seek a clarification. Uh, and what I would like to do is uh, see if some of it is covered later. And if it is not going to be covered later, I'll address it right away. If it is covered later, I'll tell that it will come back later. And do you, does anybody have any thoughts or any questions so far? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for your presentation, Professor. I have uh, two questions about your presentation. So, uh, Professor, uh, uh, I'm from Uzbekistan, and now I am a research student in Kyoto University. As you know, uh, Uzbekistan also have a developing country, a not developed country. So, what do you think? How many years we spend to increase our health system? Usually, how many years the government, which is some like Japan or uh, Germany, they spend a lot of money for increasing health system. But usually, how many years do they spend this uh, all of the countries? This is first question. Mm -hmm. And second question, what your recommendation for developing country? First, what we should do in what we're beginning, what should, we must to start. Thank you. Right. This is my old questions. Right. Thank you, Jasur. Uh, if I, if Yasur, if I understand and speak your name properly. So, firstly, let me turn the question on you. Uh, I would argue that even Japan is developing. Uh, if we were to say Japan and Germany or um, uh, US or whatever are developed, 
it suggests that there is no room for improvement. And the last one year has shown that every health system has room for improvement. So uh, that's one point I would like to make. How many years does it take? It is an ongoing process, my friend. There are new challenges emerging all the time. There are old challenges that uh, becomes relevant suddenly. Uh, Germany and Japan and the United States thought that they had controlled infectious diseases and COVID came along. And we, we have seen what has happened in Japan. We have seen what is happening in Germany. We have seen what happened in the US. So the health system is in a con, con, constant process of improvement and development. Of course, different health systems have different challenges. Uzbekistan has its own challenges. Uh, maybe Maybe it is still related to accessibility of services. Maybe it is related to quality of care. Every country has to de decide and recognize where in the path, where in the journey of a, a responsive health system or a strong health system they are. So uh, it, will take, it will take a long time for everybody. It's an ongoing process. Um, what can be done? That's a separate lecture, I'm afraid. And do I have all the answers? Absolutely not. Do I have some suggestions? Absolutely. I will only make one point that whatever needs to be done has to be decided, not by people sitting in Melbourne, Kyoto, Tokyo, Washington, or wherever. If it is Uzbekistan, it is the people of Uzbekistan and leaders like you, Yasur, who have to come together and discuss what do we want for our health system and how do we go about getting it. We can learn from everybody else, uh, but it has to be done and decided uh, internally. So uh, partly answered your question, hopefully. Uh, of course, uh, there's a whole lot of other things that I intend to cover on the topic of responsiveness of health system. So uh, we, will, we will return to some of the relevant ideas later. I, I understood, Prof. Sayako, that there were other questions too. Yes, I would like to ask uh, Swati san to ask question. And then we have also comments from Sani san. Uh, he is in the library, so we will read out his question after sure. Swati san. Okay. Swati? Good morning, Samit Sensei. Thank you for the like. It's a very good introductory lecture. I have one point um, in the slide eight. It's about the institutional relationships. So, um, I don't know this is my question or not, but uh, whenever we go to a hospital and uh, there's a number of uh, like uh, x-rays or blood tests, whatever, the doctors advise us. And uh, then sometimes they don't do the treatment and, and they refer to some another hospital because right. sometimes the case is not under their like uh, control. Mm -hmm. So when we go to some another hospital, then they again advise those same tests and those same x-rays. So right. uh, is there any anything that we can do to link this data so that there should be no repetitive uh, exposure for the x-rays or the blood test? It will cut the medical cost also, the save the time also. So yeah. there should be something which can relate this, uh, like there should be some connection between the hospitals. So this at this point we can improve the design and the function of the institutions. This is my opinion. Uh, Swati, you are right. Uh, this is some so this somehow links to Yasur's uh, Yasur's question earlier. Mm -hmm. So these are yes. the kinds of incremental improvements that can be done to make the system both perform better and to deliver yes. better health outcomes, to perform yes. more efficiently, um, because with less resources, you can achieve better goals, but also yes. be responsive to the uh, user's expectations. Mm -hmm. Who likes to be x-rayed twice? Who likes to be uh, pricked twice to collect blood? The, so that, that For that same information. Exactly. exactly, for the same information. So those are the kinds of things that can help improve in small ways uh, the responsiveness, efficiency, and effectiveness of the health system. Absolutely. How can it be done? There are many mechanisms through which it can be done. In the old yes. days, faxes would be sent. Today, in the time mm. of email, emails can be sent. Uh, yes. Today, in the time of information technology, we can have health management information systems through which these things are linked. 
and people can uh, different providers can access patients information directly there are many challenges around it and it is beyond the scope of this session to talk about it uh, data security uh, confidentiality and privacy but but that is all part of the conversational mix that needs to be taken into account uh, but yes there are there are ways to approach it absolutely one more point i would like to mention this is not about the low medical middle income country this is uh, this is about japan also mm -hmm. as a patient i face this problem and even though it is a high technology country but they don't share the data maybe they have some internal problems i don't know about that problems yes. but uh, this was the problem i faced in japan also thank it you is, so much it is not yeah. uncommon uh, it is not an yeah. easy task to do many constraints to it indeed right yes. thank you okay so i want to read out the uh, sunny sun's question yes he asked uh, that uh, the position of prima facie in medical ethics where is the position of prima facie principle in the seven elements of responsiveness can you say something about this okay that's a good question and some of it will get answered as i introduce these seven elements uh and uh, and i will engage with sani san's question if i don't please remind me uh, is that all right i suppose yes and okay. if anyone else have questions also okay, okay so far it seems not so can yeah. you please uh, proceed i will i will proceed yes so thanks for the questions and uh, i'll I'll, I'll introduce briefly, and I'll spend some time on this. Uh, what is now acknowledged and what is now recognized widely um, as a as a almost universal framework for what entails responsiveness, what constitutes responsiveness, what are the elements of responsiveness. Uh, and while questions remain about the theoretical validity and universal applicability of the elements of responsiveness there is agreement that all these elements uh, apply almost all over the world so the mix of what matters more in different settings may change but overall there is quite some agreement that this is all fine uh, this is all applicable universally while well, differences would be according to geographical cultural and care contexts huh? so and i'll i'll use some of uh, these differences to illustrate my point as i go through each of these elements if you may what is dignity uh, dignity refers to the right of a care seeker uh, somebody a patient usually to be treated as a person in their own right rather than merely as a patient so a patient but also to be treated as a person in their own rights and it includes uh, the safeguarding of human rights such as liberty to free movement for individuals uh, for example who have leprosy tuberculosis hiv infectious diseases in particular treatment with respect by healthcare staff the right to ask questions and to provide information during consultations and treatments uh, things like that uh, it also includes uh, privacy during examination and treatment uh, so it's something that keeps and upholds the the bodily and the the identity related dignity of a person um, so a important feature of a uh, element of responsiveness autonomy autonomy refers to four specific rights the right of an individual to information about uh, his or her disease and the alternative treatment options that they may uh, potentially have so this relates to uh, the facilitation of informed choice this the second right relates to the right to be consulted uh, about treatment the right to informed consent in the context of testing and also treatment and finally the right of uh, patients who are in sound mind to refuse treatment so autonomy is people having the choice and the decision to to decide and accept or refuse certain forms of treatment and the and and sani san's question some of this has come under threat and being challenged and questioned as we have seen in the covid-19 pandemic uh we have seen people not wanting vaccines 
in Germany, 20% almost, if I remember my statistics right from some time ago, whole proportion number of people in USA, for instance, are refusing vaccines. And is it right that they have the autonomy to refuse or is it by putting the lives of other people at risk that makes it necessary that they should get the vaccine? So complex discussion, but autonomy is an important element of health systems responsiveness. So, and then people have talked about different kinds of things in relation to autonomy. Uh, and and um, Professor Iwakuma has also talked about it in her re one of her recent works, which I will introduce later. The, the, the idea of a paternalistic model of healthcare, the provider makes all decisions on behalf of patient because the provider is considered better informed and better uh, knowledgeable, so on and so forth, the paternalistic model. And it goes against the whole notion of autonomy. The second model uh, is the informed decision-making model, uh, which talks about patients being given the information by the provider and then patients taking the responsibility of decision-making. The, the third model, which uh, has been introduced here, is the professional agent model. The patient willingly foregoes the dis right to say, okay, I know, I understand, but I leave the decision to the provider to say, okay, you do what you think is right. I've understood my choices. The final model introduced within the autonomy literature is the shared decision model. And people, that is patients and providers discuss, come together, come to an agreement and determine preferences and so on and so forth. So a whole lot of attention is now being paid to this topic of autonomy. It has become more important uh, as a fundamental principle in all caregiving encounters and in the responsiveness literature. Uh, these are, of course, uh, ideal types, uh, these, these four models that I have introduced. And how it plays out always depends on uh, where you are. In some cultures, you will definitely recognize that the question of autonomy is also complicated by the need to consider families' views and opinions. Uh, it also becomes complicated for pe pe uh, patients like uh, who can't express themselves or small children. Uh, and in that case, autonomy is devolved and who it is devolved to becomes an important discussion. Uh, so complicated, difficult concept, but increasingly important within the health system's responsiveness conversation. The, the third important element of health system's responsiveness relates to confidentiality. It relates to the idea that information relating to patients is private. It should not be divulged uh, without the prior permission of the um, patient. It also links to the idea of autonomy, that the patient decides what is right for them, what can be shared, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward idea, but uh, not easy to implement. The fourth major element is prompt attention, and it refers to three characteristics. Very clearly, timely care in emergencies and care within reasonable periods in non-emergency settings, uh, surgeries, and so on, and reasonable waiting times for consultations and treatments. Simple, but very complex, as we will see later. The, the next one is quality of amenities, and this relates to physical infrastructure, clean environments, um, appropriate ventilation, water, toilets, and so on and so forth. The next element is uh, access to social support networks during care, family, friends, religious support, and so on and so forth, um, those kinds of things. The last one within the WHO framework is choice of care providers. And this relates to both institutions and to individuals who are providing care. And this is an important element of health systems responsiveness, but also a very difficult one. Uh, but this becomes increasingly important as all other elements become fulfilled. And this includes the choice of the gender of the provider, the particular provider, uh, if patients want continuity of care and so on and so forth. More recently, others have elaborated upon these uh, seven elements and they have proposed the inclusion, we have proposed the inclusion of trust as an element of responsiveness, an eighth element of responsiveness. It is based on the recognition that trust is an Im 
important in determining people's expectations and their decision whether to use a particular health uh, service or not. Uh, we have written a paper about it, and I'll uh, return to it in detail a little later. While we we note that while high trust can increase and spur the utilization of services, a bit of distrust, particularly if providers are aware that people don't trust me blindly, uh, can catalyze uh, improvements in quality of care. Can catalyze improvements in systems responsiveness. Yeah. So. The others have talked about coordination. It relates to uh, the idea that Swati San just mentioned, right? She talked about coordination between different providers, so that tests don't have to be repeated, so that referrals can happen smoothly. All this becomes a part of the institutional arrangements against which responsiveness is assessed, about which responsiveness is all about. Yeah. Now. I've introduced this framework to you. I've talked about this framework, and before we proceed further to discuss the implications of this framework, uh, I would like to point out that the many uh, it raises many different questions. But I would also like to draw your attention once again to an important aspect of the definition. You will recollect from the definition that responsiveness about a system meeting the expectations of people. Uh, and and the legitimate expectations, universally legitimate expectations of the people. The key word here, once again, is expectations. So, I want you to think a bit about the many ways in which expectations can be, you know, can be. You can maybe you can make sense of these expectations, and I want to. I want to draw your attention to something um, that uh, Professor Eva Kuma has written. So she she's written a very insightful piece here, uh, where she has written about the famous Japanese medical TV series, and I must read the name here carefully. Uh, the The name of the TV series is Shiroi Kyoto, uh, translated as the Great White Tower. And it is based on a novel by Toyoko Yamazaki. The novel was dramatized twice, yeah, and first in 1970s and again in 2003. In the paper, she examines the two iterations of the uh, dramatization, and and she she talks about how the clinical communication aspect of the interaction. Specifically, the doctor-patient communication has changed, uh, and how it has evolved over time. Uh, so, with she she points out, if one reads between the lines, that the that the interaction between doctors and patients, we see more accommodation for, and greater and higher patient uh, autonomy becoming the norm. The norm shifting from a paternalistic model. To a shared decision-making model, in line with Professor Iv- what the Professor Ivakuma is pointing out, while she's focusing on the doctor-patient communication part of it, in our forthcoming paper, we develop in detail. Uh, it should come out in a month's time. The idea of expectations in healthcare, and what we propose there is, we are calling that an intersectional, translocational, and relational analytical framework. For understanding space, patients' healthcare-related expectations, and the uh, translocational also refers to temporal. Over time, these expectations and models change. Yeah, and uh, all these. What are the dignity-related expectations? What are the autonomy-related expectations? What are the attention-related expectations? All of this changes. Uh, as one moves from one place to other, whether it is Swati San coming from India. To Kyoto, she comes with a preset set of expectations. Uh, whether it is Yasur San coming from Kazakhstan to uh, Uzbekistan, sorry, to to Japan, uh, over time things change. I have a PhD scholar who's working on it, and I'll share some details later. So that complicates further uh, the kinds of implications it has for policy, uh, practice, and also uh, research. I will pause here for a bit. 
but we will return to the idea of expectations again uh, in the uh, in, in the sections that uh, that come in later uh, so what we will now discuss are some questions for policy practice and research that uh, the concept of health systems responsiveness triggers this should be of interest to the faculty members who happen to be here but it should also be of interest to students uh, who will return to their countries or who will join the public health uh, the practice field within uh, japan or in their home countries and also some of you who might carry on to become health policy and systems researchers depending on how you look at it and depending on your role whatever it might be uh, there are interesting challenges and opportunities one of the interesting challenges relates to the applicability of this framework and the mix of different elements of health systems responsiveness as i have discussed earlier some critics have questioned the validity of the use of a single framework or a single composite score to study health systems in different societies societies which have different cultural different economic different political different health system structures so that becomes an important question both for policy and practice but also for researchers this is the basis for one of the studies that we are currently doing in ghana and vietnam where we are comparing the health systems responsiveness to the needs and expectations of pregnant women who have mental health issues there are there are questions of uh, applicability of this framework to different contexts another interesting Uh, line of inquiry and another interesting implications for uh, uh, policy and practice relates to the meaning of each of these elements we have talked about all these elements what is dignity in japan what is is it the same as dignity in uzbekistan kazakhstan india nepal vietnam australia are the understandings of confidentiality different i will go one step further i would go one can also have different understandings of different elements across different care contexts is dignity the same in a general practitioner interaction is dignity the same in a general practitioner interaction and a laboratory x-ray setting is it the same in an intensive care setting is confidentiality the same in these settings these are important things to consider uh as one talks about responsiveness from a policy design policy implementation and practice uh, orientation and if we don't have these answers these become important research questions i draw your attention to an important and very complicated feature of the definition the notion of legitimate expectations the notion of legitimacy and the the notion of a universally legitimate expectations if you remember the definition it talks about responsiveness to universally legitimate expectations rather than to individuals expectations because individuals expectations are very personal they may even maybe societal but they are very personal the argument that this definition makes and the whole concept makes is that having universally legitimate expectations will allow one to assess responsiveness across health systems it throws up many issues how does one arrive at how does one decide what is legitimate at what level should this demarcation of legitimacy occur at the global level national level local level service type uh, tertiary secondary primary care different kinds of services emergency services outpatient services inpatient services how can one accommodate such diversity you will recognize that there will be different expectations which are legitimate across these contexts how can one accommodate it in any effort that tries to define and specify what this means diversity across countries across social groups men women adolescents elderly married unmarried gay not gay all of this becomes uh complicated difficult in terms of policy and practice this is an important challenge but it also produces and creates opportunities for research yeah 
we have to recognize that the individual expectations which are related to satisfaction are intimately re- connected with the uh, universally legitimate expectations that the definition of responsiveness is talking about and and the individual's expectations are somehow aspirational what i wanted today i want more later and one cannot just say that okay just because sumit wants something it's legitimate or not legitimate we also want to look at how we develop things further expectations also evolve so uh, as jasur was saying yasur was saying development is continuing uh, improvements continue so expectations must keep track they must keep matching so from a research and comparative research perspective these become very challenging issues and all these issues apply to all the eight dimensions and sometimes as somebody who studies and works on and thinks about this subject i even wonder whether it is possible to even com- do comparative research at all and that's what we are trying to do uh um in 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 the kinds of studies that we are implementing at this stage i want to pause here uh, very briefly we we um we want to keep this lecture within time but if people have any questions uh, i would like to take them now um we've got 30 40 minutes 35 minutes still uh, we can use the question time and the session efficiently um please feel free to share your thoughts um and i i want to i want to give some examples about how do you demarcate legitimacy but if you've got some thoughts already i would like to hear some of your reflections if i'm making myself clear uh if you want any clarification yes thank you and let's uh ask everyone if you have some comments or questions and also sunny san have another comment so i will read first on behalf yes. of him he says uh, prof kane in my opinion the elements of uh seven elements of responsiveness is narrow many yes. aspects that are not included in the element for example demography the gap of health service between remote rural and urban area is different thus will influence expectation of the individuals can we widen the scope of responsiveness by demography for example i want no i want to know your opinion about gaps of health service in rural and urban related to responsiveness right good i think this is a good question my answer to uh, whether demography can be included in these elements the answer would be no but no but yes how is the question uh, what sani san you're trying to say is that these expectations vary by geography you are absolutely right but the elements that constitute a responsive health system uh doesn't include demography it will it how they apply to different demographies is probably what you mean what is a responsive health system what are the expectations varies by different demographic groups for a young person it's different for a middle aged person these expectations are different expectations around dignity expectations around uh, uh confidentiality expectations around accommodation and amenities uh they would be very different for the elderly and and i think you uh, i understand where you come you're coming from i have just begun a project which is trying to understand this is something we're doing in india trying to understand the responsiveness of the health system to the needs and expectations of the elderly india is rapidly aging many parts of india uh, are becoming quite close to how japan is at the moment and uh, but we have our system does not recognize the fact that such a large number of people are elderly so we are trying to understand from a policy analysis uh, orientation where is the policy response to the aging population is it responsive to the needs and expectations of the growing elderly uh, so in that sense 
it is possible to expand the scope of what those elements are and i invite you to conduct research to say okay what is it unique uh, what is unique for the context of japan maybe context of some another country that should also be there i can warn you that as we were writing our paper for the inclusion of the idea of trust as an element even i had doubts and i still had doubts whether it fits and if you read the paper we've written you'll recognize the kinds of things we've raised there adding an element uh, is possible it has to be very uh, well justified uh, and i would invite japan to construct its own idea of what they think are elements of responsiveness um, any other thoughts Thank you. Uh, I'm Takashi from Medical Communication. And now I've got to know about responsiveness. Uh, I kind of think that uh, all countries, including Japan, are developing in, res uh, in health systems responsiveness. And we need cross-cutting cross understandings and cooperation. And as, as a medical communication student, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, do you have any advice about the most important point we need to share uh, in responsiveness when we communicate this concept among different people, uh, not only health researchers or health experts? Yes, yes. Uh, Takashi-san, this is a, I, I couldn't agree more. Huh? Uh, I agree with you that this is an important area of common interest across countries. Uh, and different settings, different contexts will have different uh, things that are important. Uh, and I will share a few examples with you. And I use the liberty of uh, returning to my talk because you have raised a point, um, which is, how should I say, which, which allows us to, you know, start understanding mm -hmm. that it, it can be different in different settings. Take the example of uh, waiting times for elective procedures in hospitals, right? Uh, if you are talking to a hospital administrator, if you are talking to policymakers, uh, it is important to understand that they are concerned about, say, for cataract, the surgery for eye. Mm -hmm. What is a reasonable waiting time? In many countries across the world, we have seen this debate going on about what is a uh, good waiting time? Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it one year? Mm. There is no agreement on it. But the important principle is exactly as you say. People may have different views on what is a reasonable waiting time. The key question is to have a conversation about waiting times. Mm. The, the key qu point is that to have a consensus-based conversation about waiting times, not only an economics-based or a uh, narrowly policy-focus-based conversation about uh, waiting times. In other services, uh, uh, Takashi-san, it's uh, easier, right? For instance, trauma services. Waiting time agreement is simple, right? If somebody breaks a leg, we know that we will not be waiting for a long time. Isn't it? it so in every field, in every area, there is room for a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, what constitutes a pleasant environment? Mm -hmm. It will vary depending on people's aspirations. Mm -hmm. But it's an important conversation. Am I engaging with your question in mm -hmm. any, in some way? Yes. Uh I'd like to keep thinking more about the idea of responsiveness. And actually, I'm Professor Miho Yakuma introduced this lecture to me, and I'm being really impressed today. Thank you. Right. Okay, thanks. I want to build on uh, what Takashi-san has um, raised now, and I want to share a couple of examples in some ways. Yeah, I've talked about elective surgeries, I've talked about emergencies, I've, I've briefly introduced the idea of uh, what is a pleasant environment. Uh, we can also talk about facilities this way, right? Sh should all facilities have ramps? Uh, you know, the, the sliding way to walk 
when where you can uh, roll a wheelchair when in fact there may not be enough money or resources to change the existing infrastructure in many low middle income countries or there may not be enough resources to build lifts to accommodate for the needs and expectations of those with physical uh, disabilities how do we have those conversations these are important policy uh, and practice related uh, questions which have a bearing on the idea of responsiveness is it legitimate to have these expectations so the policy and practice related expectations and challenges are understandable they can be foreseen now you can anticipate all of us can anticipate they are somehow obvious but the challenges around research as as probably takashi san was also alluding particularly around comparative research and cross country research um are quite complicated huh? they are slightly more difficult and i will brief, briefly touch upon these here uh, i i i want to i want to introduce some ideas that have been introduced to say okay how can we do cross country research on responsiveness if so much of it depends on what people in each country think is a legitimate expectation right so from health systems responsiveness to research and a comparative research perspective and uh, uh I, to enable comparison a zone of tolerance approach has been uh, proposed uh, this idea attempts to take into account that there tends to be a zone of tolerance around what people tend to expect from services i take a simple uh, starting point uh, people's expectations around the kinds of physical amenities and infrastructure might vary from context to context and that people recognize that uh, resources that are available to them uh, are limited and they tailor their expectations according to their understanding and their cultural understandings so people who have proposed this idea this idea of a zone of tolerance to allow country comparisons context comparisons say that you can also use this to compare different kinds of services the example that is given typically relates to beds in hospital if you look at many parts of the world uh, sleeping on the floor at home is normal and perfectly acceptable and it is always done uh since um you know since yeah we sleep on the floor in many parts of the world right and people will not take offense if they are asked to also sleep on the floor in a hospital the question then becomes is it reasonable for some people in the hospital to have a bed uh, which is uh, standing on high and others have to sleep on the floor if the hospital is crowded if there are not enough resources if there is not enough money if there is not enough space for everybody who comes to a crowded hospital in a low and middle income country contexts is it okay how tolerable and how legitimate it is for some patients to have floor beds to to uh, to accommodate for these real life situations and this is a simple example of course this zone of tolerance approach has been proposed huh? because it relates to a social norm this is a simple example which is possibly socially accepted in some countries uh, however the same cannot be said for other elements of responsiveness right dignity and confidentiality i i would expect that the zone of tolerance around dignity would be very narrow no matter where you go in some countries the zone of tolerance around dignity might be extremely high they uh, people would be not willing to 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 compromise on dignity at any extent uh, uh, no matter where you go so so it depends on the element that one can use this zone of tolerance approach for comparative research if i understand the question right and i wanted to touch upon it anyway but one has to also realize that the whole notion of zone of tolerance is potentially also problematic from a policy and practice perspective because it uh, creates the risk that it is manipulated to indicate that something is acceptable for somebody 
and not acceptable for others and it creates the possibility that oh it's a poor country you can have this it's fine nobody has a good toilet anyway so they can uh, live with dirty toilets and so on and so forth yeah? so one has to realize that uh, there are limitations to this idea of zone of tolerance other uh, uh, research is required i think which may have a comparative element but also recognizes and emphasizes a specific element and i'll introduce some of the possibilities and some of the ideas uh in in the next uh, slide here here i i talk about a whole range of research questions around what all shapes people's care experiences expectations and responsiveness we have proposed this framework in a paper we have written in 2017 uh different aspects of the framework if you note they lend themselves to meaningful and very useful i think and very practical research in public health uh, in different parts of the world including japan from small projects to large projects uh, research and inquiries focused on different care domains we can do it in different settings primary care secondary care tertiary care we can look at maternity care all of this can be done we can focus on the interaction larger projects we can look out on the left side which is what do the policy makers managers service providers think is possible in terms of dignity autonomy what do they think is going on we can conduct surveys we can use a whole range of approaches quantitative qualitative we can draw on many different disciplines uh and i i turn to takashi san's uh question once again for instance uh, to 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 give an example if it is perfectly possible to conduct anthropological or ethnographic or sociological inquiry into understanding what does dignity mean in different care settings what does dignity mean in um uh, cambodia what does dignity mean in ethiopia what does dignity mean in japan and how are they different what does dignity mean in an emergency setting what does dignity mean in a laboratory setting for instance um uh, in a maternity setting what happens to how people expect uh to be treated in terms of dignity in different settings what do families think about it what role do families play what role do social norms play communities play in shaping these expectations in shaping the uh, uh, experiences of care so one can one can approach this subject in terms of research from many different angles one can approach it to understand what is feasible what can we do what goals we set for our health system and how do we work towards it so we argue that this framework allows a whole bunch of things to be imagined in terms of uh, uh, uh both research and also in terms of policy and practice as i come close to uh, finishing my talk and making my point uh, i hope i'm doing okay with time let me see yeah we've got 10 more minutes uh, i would like to share with you how we are uh, with concrete examples of how i am trying to do some of those things some of my ongoing research one of my phd students is working on theorizing uh, and concept pr- pr- proposing a conceptual overview presenting a conceptual overview of uh, healthcare related expectations we are suggesting how could one go about studying healthcare related expectations she is conducting an empirical study on recent migrants experiences of the australian health system uh and and she's trying to see okay people who have come to australia within the last few years uh how do they experience the health system does the system's understanding of what are legitimate expectations matching with their expectations and what can we do to improve the australian health system's responsiveness i've talked about the study in ghana and vietnam where we are comparing different meanings and understandings of uh, different elements of responsiveness and we are comparing 
what enables the health system to be responsive to the needs of pregnant women who have mental health issues uh, a phd student who has just completed her research uh, has not explicitly focused on responsiveness but a whole lot of her findings have implications for the responsiveness of pakistan's health system to those suffering from multi drug resistant tuberculosis and as i said we are beginning a study which is trying to unpack uh, and understand the responsiveness of the health system to the needs of uh, elderly in india in the state of tamil nadu where we have uh, a rapidly growing uh, el population of the po population of the elderly what i've shared today um, and what i've discussed so far i think and i'm sure you would all somehow agree is not just important um, in terms of recognizing and appreciating uh, the subject as a public health practitioner or policy maker it also lends itself to meaningful and very useful practical research in the field of public health no matter where you are in the world i hope you found this session useful um, and i hope i have been able to spark some interest in the topic of a responsive health system uh, amongst the many uh, of Uh, you who are here who are uh, thankfully attending the session today i also hope the challenges that i have shared don't appear too daunting um, challenges both for policy and practice and for research uh, research on the topic of responsiveness they don't appear too daunting and they in fact amplify your interest and encourage and spur some of you to tackle the many exciting research opportunities and questions that this uh, this topic uh, lends itself to um finally i would very much like to hear from you uh, both the faculty members uh, post docs students alike your thoughts your ideas your criticisms and i hope we can do some exciting work together and i can contribute to some developing some of the ideas that you might have emerging from this uh, uh, this discussion i will stop sharing my screen uh, thanks once again i have my email id there you can also find me on my university web page uh, thank you so much thank you professor kane and now we still have about 10 minutes so let's just have some time for uh, question and comments anyone have comments questions nakano mari san Thank you very much. Um, now this is just a comment. Now um, I'm sure the one of the key was maybe our expectations, and I think it's important to have conversations. And as you said, uh, and we need to try to make discussions and expectations very active. I really appreciate your lecture. Thank you very much. thank you uh, thanks for the kind words and you are bang on the key question uh, the key issue the key point the centerpiece of this whole conversation mm -hmm. is indeed expectations and and that that is contested mm -hmm. that is controversial that is challenging and what is a legitimate expectation who decides are we even having a meaningful conversation about what are reasonable and legitimate expectations are we are, are we engaging with those whose expectations are being met as a health system uh, as health system researcher are we are we even asking these questions uh, is there a disconnect is there a connect how are they aligned i think these are really exciting questions uh, with which which we all of us can uh, meaningfully engage with uh, no matter where we are Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments, questions, Swati? This is just a comment, Simon Sensei. Um, I think the doctor-patient communication is also related to expectation. I believe doctor-patient communication varies as the field of the doctor. The pediatricians are more communicative. If I compare with neurosurgeons and cardio surgeons. the patients are always confused they don't know what to speak and what to say so again then they are uh, left back with the passive expectations which are not fulfilled 
Right, right. That's a that's a good point. Uh, I would I would qualify this uh, Swati. I would go. Yes. You know, um, there is a historical tendency for certain kinds of certain types of care providers to be not yes. so good at communicating. Right. Right. Uh, right. The good news is. And, and this is something that is borne out in uh, 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 Professor Miho's paper uh, that I talked about, that yes. things are changing. Even this, uh, all professions, all subspecialties. I'm a dermatologist by training. Uh, and, okay. I've, and, and I've seen this change happening huh? uh, for whatever reasons. There's a whole range of reasons. Some of it is driven by litigational threats. Some of this is uh, driven by internal conversations within the profession. Some of mm -hmm. this is uh, driven by Google, right? Okay. Pe people, mm -hmm. people go and find and they are better informed and that makes life easy for doctors, not so easy for others. But there are also some uh, peculiar disciplinary processes which will take time. But there is a change that is happening in terms of doctor-patient communication. The, the, our role as public health experts, policymakers, whatever we become, practitioners, researchers, is to contribute to this conversation, saying that, hey, listen, there, are room, there is room for improvement here. The development, the developing and developed conversation comes back, Swati. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, thank you. You are right. It is uh, definitely it's improving. I, I also believe so. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else? Maybe someone who haven't uh, spoken yet? Uh, yes, Ms. Uh, or Mr. Mutanov. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Professor, for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a, a question about, um, can we use uh, statistical data to evaluate the uh, health system responsiveness. Uh, maybe this is a little bit uh, the uh, indirect way. Uh, for example, if we want to evaluate emergency unit uh, responsiveness, uh, for example, how many people uh, applied with cardiac arrest and what's the outcome from uh, this how many people died and how many uh, people uh, still alive uh, from the outcome? What's the outcome? Uh, is it possible to evaluate uh, using statistical data? For example, two countries' uh, data is different in Japan or uh, the other countries. For example, uh, how the, to evaluate the system uh, by using uh, uh, how, uh, about the illness and um, incidence of uh, some uh, disease or uh, just using statistics? Is it, uh, how, how, how do you think about this point? This is a very good question, Babur. Uh, I, I, I think a uh, whole lot can be done here. Yeah, mm. uh, there are, and certain elements of responsiveness, Babur, particularly, lend themselves ah. very nicely to statistical analysis. Of course, yeah. a lot depends on the availability of appropriate data. And the good news is you can, you can use service data to, mm. to raise questions and not necessarily to provide answers. And raising mm. questions about responsiveness using statistical data is an excellent starting point. I, uh, the example you gave, however, uh, probably relates more to quality of care rather yeah. than to uh, responsiveness. But <laughs> the, the, the same example can be turned around slightly. The, if somebody come, uh, experiences a cardiovascular event, from the moment of, uh, you can have statistical data about, if it is possible, about a bunch of time points from the moment mm. they experience it to the time taken to reach the facility from the moment they reach the facility 
time taken for them to be uh, a first seen from the mm. time taken for them to be first seen to the appropriate intervention happening and then yeah. the outcome which is distant okay. each no. but but till these different moments each of them reveal something to us about the responsiveness of the health system to no. the needs needs of the population not the individual the individual has only one expectation the, the it's a good example because everybody would have the same expectation here it's universal i want to get there quickly that particular window of time i want to be treated on time mm. and maybe live <laughs> right yeah yes so so you have a whole bunch of possibilities around uh using of routine service data and mm. to statistically analyze it to reveal certain questions hey what is happening ah so uh but there are other things which are slightly difficult huh? uh confidentiality for instance yeah yeah uh, so but but for some it really lends itself very nicely hi thank you for your answer yeah thank you for the presentation you're welcome yeah thanks good question okay maybe we can take one more last questions if anybody would like to comment or ask questions maybe i would like to also ask questions uh i think everyone including me is very uh well aware of the importance of health uh responsiveness and uh it has a lot to do uh we have many challenges we have to face but uh think about what would be the incentives or the advantages from the health providers point of view can you give me any of your ideas about this yes thank you thank you um, this is a is an interesting question because in writing the grant applications that have led to this research studies we have we have built our argument around exactly this yeah uh, a a system that is responsive to the needs and expectation of uh, of the population is in the interest of the health system but it is also in the interest of the our political masters right if the population feels if the population thinks that they have been consulted in setting the standards for what is legitimately accepted at a social level and then those standards are met then the then the population is likely to think that our leaders our political masters are doing the right thing i i also research as part of my research uh, do uh, research on violence against uh, doctors in india yeah uh, in the last 10 years we have seen a whole number of incidents where doctors are being beaten up their clinics are being broken down and so on and so forth one of the arguments i make is that this is a mismatch of expectations and a uh, research into an uh, active engagement among with the population about what should be a reasonable expectation given what we are given our health system will allow um, this conversation to happen properly the providers and the health system to better meet these reasonable expectations and also satisfy our leaders and political masters thank you very much that, that gives me uh more ideas about how difficult and still we have to take a long time discussing about this issue in the society yes okay so it's almost time so thank you so much professor kane uh we learn a lot from you and i uh, hope that we have another opportunity to uh, get to know more about and uh, so once again we would like to thank you and if some of your you participants can show your face to uh, thank uh, professor kane thank you okay so this is the uh, end of the short course thank you so much Thank you thank you everybody for attending it's been a pleasure